I'll take POIs uh, verbally, please. Seven things in this speech. Firstly, on the comparative, what we're going to defend is that his license will be suspended, but we're going to allow him to exist as a consultant on an ad hoc basis. Two things to note here. The first is that this happens at present where they consult with professors in the show and also in the medical practice, but these people aren't necessarily practicing MDs, which suggests to you that there is precedent that would allow this. Secondly, there is a revealed preference at Princeton Plainsborough for doing this exact practice. They do this in season three, for instance. Foreman does this, uh, and, and I would just note, for instance, that they do this in the episode episode where House has to come back and diagnose the like liver, the, the lung transplant, for instance, and bail him out of prison in order to do that, do that on, a, on a judge uh, order. That suggests to you that there is precedent for this, that he can exist on a consultative basis. And I would importantly flag here that he's not going to have any powers associated with this, which means that he's not going to have a prescription pad. He's not going to be able to make any final decisions. His decision is only consultative and it is only called on when the team needs an additional opinion. Why will he accept this? Two reasons. Firstly, he thinks Cuddy is hot. Secondly, he likes puzzles a lot, and that is incredibly important because he likes to chase solving puzzles, and that is the whole character archetype of uh, House, which I'm so sure Xavier knows. Okay, secondly, why is the team sufficiently good? Firstly, uh, I just flag here that obviously we get to rely on all the consultative benefits that I've just claimed to you and proven that we would likely get from House in the comparative. But firstly, obviously they're doctors as well. Maybe not as good as House, but they are pretty good and probably 90% of the way there. And the second point to flag here is obviously they have experience working with House. I would note that the team members consist of uh, the blonde one, the other blonde one, Foreman, and the other one that I can't remember the names of. All of them are quite experienced working with House, and all of that suggests to you that they're likely to be able to adopt his practice are pretty familiar with the almanacs upon which he develops his diagnoses and like uh, there is just evidence in the show of people besting him like there is an episode for instance where Kutner like uh is able to outsmart him with the AIDS diagnosis I'm sure you remember that in that episode Xavier that probably suggests to you that there's a lot of instances where these people are smarter than thinking uh than House and obviously instances where they can be just as good thirdly though obviously they can continue to train to become as good as House if not better than House noting that they have more time that he is going to be alive which probably suggests that they can become better over over a long time horizon. But fourthly, uh, they have mentors in the form of Wilson, Cuddy, and Foreman who can continue to develop their knowledge, who do exist in some similar manners to House does, which means that they can continue and improve and like give uh, tutelage to the uh, team in this way. Importantly, though, the team is lunch likely to function better in our world when they're not like overpowered by house which happens far worse in the world where house is part of the team whereas when he is consultative he can override but the team he the team can override him when they think that he uh, like has a bad decision they don't feel as crowded out in the diagnostic space which means they're free to come up with decisions that are good free to do all these kind of diagnostic trials Okay, House puts patients at risk. And I know the opposition is going to get up and say, oh, but House is really good at responding to a very unique set of cases. All of the analysis that I've just explained explains why his team is likely to be able to respond to these cases and likely to be able to consult on him in these very specific instances of cases, which means the, the burden for opposition to actually prove this is incredibly high. They need to explain to you why uh, then like all of this stuff doesn't apply. I don't know, figure it out. Okay, House puts people at risk. Let's explain that. Four ways he does this. Firstly, is willful disregard regard for human safety he does things like just like crazy things that no reasonable doctor would do uh, like the intuition being like giving drugs to patients that are ex incredibly experimental like there is an episode where he gives like uh like uh medication to a coma patient that would give them a migraine so that he can test a thesis that he wants this is incredibly absurd this is the kind of thing that a doctor would not do secondly though he ignores consent he just doesn't give a fuck about it he wants to get to the final result this is the kind of thing that he does in order to solve his puzzles because that is what his character archetype is more motivated by than uh the actual result of getting good patient outcomes thirdly though he does the whole thing while he's high, which is like really bad. And what I would know here is that even if in a lot of instances he, able, he is able to do this reasonably well, there is evidence in the show that he does mismanage his drugs and does do things which actually puts patients at risk. I would cite the episode where he has a heroin overdose and falls asleep in his office and Foreman has to wake him up by twisting his nipples to get his neuro uh, like receptors to like wake up or whatever the case may be. That is an instance where he over like where his mismanagement of his heroin doses literally results in him nearly dying. These are the kind of things that clouded his 
judgment in that episode, but Clyde's his judgment in other episodes. And I would just note that he makes a series of bad judgments throughout the series as a, res- as a direct result of his drug usage. But fourthly, obviously the th- thing that I flagged is that this man chases puzzles as opposed to good patient outcomes. All of that results in patients being put at risk. Now let's explain why this is bad, even if those patients are not put at risk. I think that's like the fourth or fifth thing. The first thing to say here is that it just makes patient care a lot worse because he does things like ignore consent and disrespect wishes. I would note here that a lot of the conflicts that happen in the show are things like him conflicting with Hasidic Jews and deeply religious like Jehovah's Witnesses where he gives them blood in the show despite that not being their religion, religious wishes and then lying to them about that after the fact, which literally fucking sends them to hell, guys. That's quite a bad harm in this debate. Obviously then that is like, an infinite harm that he's just scaled onto one individual at least, right? He probably does that to other people, but he disrespects other people's religious ways and a number of people. But he's also just incredibly rude and disrespectful. He literally breaks and enters into people's houses without their consent. That is quite bad. Finally, uh, next though, the precedent that he sets for other doctors. His behavior emboldens other doctors, which is what they say to Cuddy when they come and request absurd practices and surgeries that uh, they say, ah, but houses do it, so we should be allowed to do it. That is the kind of discussions that goes on in the Oval Desk in Cuddy's office. These are the kind of things that are emboldened by uh, houses' behavior. But in addition to this, I would just flag that even if we're not, even if we, uh, even in addition to not actively emboldening them. We flip this because we send a clear message to other doctors that this kind of uh, unethical medical behavior is clearly unacceptable and should not be tolerated, which means that this doesn't occur writ large. It means that similar offenses don't occur with other doctors. Before I move on, close in opposition. You describe employing a doctor who has had their license suspended and occasionally taking their advice. This is medical malpractice and would get everyone in the hospital disbarred, which explains why it is the unlikely alternative and you don't have fiat in this debate. Uh, Princeton Plainsborough, Xavier would know, is, has a reveal preference for doing some shady things. They're likely to cover this up in ways that means that they can do this, even if it means doing medical malpractice things. But I would observe that they can do informal consultations, which don't even necessarily rely on him being a consultant. They can do things like call him up because he is a friend of Cuddy. They can do things like call him up and request his uh, like uh, things. Fine. Uh, nextly on cost, right? Uh, Cuddy reveals in the show that there are literally millions of dollars in a slush fund that is just dedicated to lawsuits directed at House. Most of these lawsuits are directed at House. Structurally, if you don't believe that empirically, that is because he does most of the dodgy practices as the info side uh, points to. This significantly decreased the cost from lawsuits that the hospital has to incur. That means that they can do more money in research, more money into things like patient care. That is better for patients. That is why we ought uh, uh, support uh, his suspension. But finally, on addiction. Firstly, he can't prescribe, which means he can't support his own forms of addiction, and he's more likely to be removed from the process, which means the other people don't support his forms of addiction. Secondly, Cuddy, Wilson, and Foreman are likely to continue to support his efforts to curtail and stop addiction, which is likely to continue and be successful over a long period of time. And thirdly, if he's suspended, he might just take that seriously and actually do something about his addiction. Incredibly proud to govern. That's really good. All right, I thank the PM for that speech, and I welcome the Leader of Opposition to begin their team's case. Here, here. Can you hear me, Eleanor? It does not matter if House has a very good team or has a very skilled team, because what is often crucial to a doctor-patient relationship is the rapport that those two personalities and those two characters have developed. That is to say, to the extent that you suspend this doctor that is clearly very entrenched and very popular and clearly has a backlog of patients that trust him with their medical diagnosis, even if this diagnosis is cooked and wacko. Uh, I've never watched the show. I have no idea what actually happens. So that was all. A lot, that was a lot of shocking material from Prime Minister there. Wonder how we'll do now. Um, but I think to the extent that that is true, uh, like you, if, this, he, if he is gone, people ne- don't necessarily buy into the team or buy into the people around him. Therefore, it's not guaranteed that these patients actually receive the type of care that they need following this. A few elements to the speech. Firstly, some setup. Secondly, I'm going to talk about his contribution to medicine and why that is worthy enough and like good enough that he should not be suspended. And then secondly, I'm going to talk about why what he does post suspension is far worse. Firstly, on setup, it's important to note here that this guy is like the best in the industry. That is to say that it probably looks like having a high degree of success, a high degree of patients getting over their issues and therefore having it probably a very popular demand by even despite the fact that he's being quite wacko or whatever he does uh, and there's being like a backlog of patients who want to see him who have follow-up appointments are doing like very long-term treatments and i think that the the what is indicative of that is the fact that they probably have a rapport developed between those two individuals in which he knows his patients quite well and they know his methods quite well even though his methods are orthodox i also want a piece of mitigation here which is to say that i think addiction is very common in the medical industry that is to say it's a very high stress industry with lots of burnout and turnover and the people in that industry make like pretty decent money 
money, therefore have access to like uh, like drugs and cigarettes and alcohol. Therefore, this issue is actually pretty widespread. Like opioid addiction is not super unique to this individual here, but yet we still let lots of other doctors and stuff like that practice. Secondly, important to know to get to this point, you would have he would have had like he would have been trusted by his team in his specific role. That is to say, he probably would have become an integral element of the ladder. Therefore, removing him as I analyze later, but it would be quite damaging to the hospital. But I think people have adapted to his style, even if it is unorthodox and quite wacky, because he's quite old and quite established in the industry and his position. I think thirdly on violations, I think that the case we're going to prove to you today is that he does this when he thinks that the sort of medical textbook or the rules limit his ability to give the best outcome for his patient. We're going to tell you why even if he is super like ends justify the means, why that ultimately the patient outcome is the priority here. And this makes him a very good, if not unorthodox, comp uh, uh, unorthodox doctor. Let's talk about his contribution to medicine here. Because sure, I think he may break protocols as per all the wacky characterization that Prime Minister gives us, but I think he puts his patient outcomes first. That is to say that this man is an unorthodox thinker. I think of lots of professionals. The problem with lots of professionals and other doctors taking his role is that they are often too by the book and too scared to deviate from the textbook for specifically very niche, uh, like niche instances or things that are like uh, pretty like risk averse, etc. And I think that the unique contribution that this gentleman makes to the medical industry is by uh, looking outside the box and thinking creatively. Like all the characterization that said gives you should make you believe that ultimately the people who are approaching him are probably approaching him because uh, it was a like there was like there was not many other options. They believed that he would hear them out and he would apply unorthodox strategies, which I think requires him to hear out unorthodox instances. People who are experiencing weird symptoms, people who are experiencing weird illnesses that other traditional doctors would have just said, you're crazy, go away. I think that is an incredibly important contribution that this man makes to the medical system. But I also think that at the yeah. fundamental level, you are disrupting the team that is operating in. I don't know any of these characters that Seb assert. I hope he's actually asserting it into the debate. I, I hope he's not mechanistically proving it for my own benefit here. But he just talks about all these random people. But like, even if those people are entrenched, like that is the reason you believe that it's going to be really hard to adapt without him. And like, it's likely that these pay people are quite devoted to him, devoted to him as a practitioner, his his leadership style, his orthodoxy. And as a result, you're probably going to have these people like, leave the like the medical like, leave the hospital or go elsewhere. And as a result, you can't guarantee that this team is even going to be in existence at the point in which this guy leaves. And I'll talk about the whole consultancy thing in a second because that was weird as well. But I also think that like, uh, even if they are skillful, you are losing an integral an integral leader. And even and when you lose that leader, the people who've developed a rapport with him are also probably going to be reluctant to see this hospital. Therefore, we're going to now talk about the kind of factual. Because at the point at which the medical practice is integral to his, his identity, and he's very erratic, and he probably doesn't want to spiral into just opioids and nothing else, I think he's likely to be very proactive in an unofficial capacity. That is to say that he's likely to become something like a home doctor, in which he performs all the things that all the, all the things that o OG says are really, really bad. He performs in an unofficial capacity. That is to say that all the harms are compounded from opening government, because he does this with absolutely zero oversight. He does it in an unofficial, uh, like informal capacity. And to the extent that you believe the material about like him building a rapport with lots of patients and having a backlog of people who trust him because of the unorthodox strategies, those people like to flow onto his and uh, like still demand his very informal and unofficial like uh, forms of medical practice here. Uh, also, the next Frangles has said that he might become a medical podcast influencer. That is harmful because podcasts are bad. Cool. Okay, let's talk about this whole consultancy thing, because to the extent that you believe that this is an integral element to his identity, he's not just going to sit in a desk and just give out words. He's going to go further than that. He's going to want to keep practicing in some capacity. To the extent that he can't like actually operate in a legal hospital, he operates via other methods with no oversight, potentially meaning that if you buy all of the material from opening government about how he does like fucked up, hooked things to his patients, I don't know, the, whatever drug thing Seb said, like apply that, but absolutely no scrutiny, no team, or if the team does follow him here, they're very devoted to him, and, and like, you get no medical board looking at him, etc., or it's very hard to. Uh, it's it's comparatively harder than any of these under the eyes of a hospital system. I'll take a POI from opening. Foreman and Cuddy make deviations from medical practices, sometimes in very rare instances, but we explain that Cuddy is more sensitive to hospital liability and things like patient care, which means when she does it, it's better than when House does it. This is like one person in a large hospital and team. Like, I, I, there's probably other people that this um, a lot of this material applies to. Like, asserting that one person does this job just doesn't respond to any of the material I give about how you've built a rapport with one specific individual, where the character interactions between the patient and the doctor are very personalized, these people have developed a trust of this person, which is to say that I think the patients that the, like, you likely have a backlog of in the uh, in the uh, in the government world are likely then to like uh, like feel betrayed by the medical system. Like I think the medical system, particularly after the past rough few years it's had, needs all the trust it can get, all the faith it can get. And I think these people, even if you believe that this faith is irrational or misplaced, these people have that faith uh, in him specifically. So to the extent you remove him from the picture, these people perceive it as like a failure of the medical system as a whole. And I think that even if you relegate him to a consultancy position, they 
still see the medical system as attempting to limit a man that has actually given them a lot of benefit in life, a man who was able to hear them out in very niche circumstances when the counterfactual was doctors who otherwise probably wouldn't have, even if the sort of uh, treatments that he applies in the short terms are not like, great or are pretty uh, illethical, if the patient outcome at the end is good. We defend that. And we think that patients should have the autonomy and the agency to make sacrifices based on his treatment in the short term. If it means they believe at the end they get the long-term outcome, we should put the trust in the patient to pick him. Uh, we, we should put the trust in the patient to pick him, build that rapport to the extent that he is so in, this is so integral to his identity. If you kick him out of the medical industry, he just does all the things that government says, but in an unofficial, unscrutinized capacity, extremely proud to oppose. Okay, I thank the Leader of the Opposition for that speech and welcome the DPM to continue their team's case. Here, here. Dr. Teo, the neurosurgeon who performed unconventional treatments on patients in New South Wales, is the response to main contributions to OO. Unconventional methods on vulnerable patients isn't a benefit in this debate. They can kill someone who otherwise would have lived a few more years. They can permanently paralyze people who would have preferred mobility to a longer life. And just like New South Wales limited Dr. Teo's practice, we support suspending um, Dr. House. Two questions here. First, how does this impact the efficacy of the practice he works at? And secondly, how does this impact the field of medicine more broadly? So first on the efficacy of the practice he works at. And the OO claim is quite simple. It's just that he's the leading diagnostic physician. You're unable to achieve the same results without, uh, without him. We think that obviously someone will take over his team and something that he they never responded to that we contributed is that many of his techniques have been passed down to surrounding doctors. First, he works with a full team. They are aware of his techniques. They apply them with him. So Secondly, they have no, been known to outsmart him and come up with better solutions than he would have in that situation. Thirdly, they're likely to use techniques that they have learned from him in instances where they are the only solution compared to House, who is likely to apply those unconventional techniques in every instance, even when they are not needed. And so that means that on a comparative, it is just way better for other people to take over, you know, in, in this realm and actually apply his techniques because they will apply them judicially compared to him who is more likely to apply them um, sporadically. And we think that even if he does not work as a consultant, that's fine. We do not mind because there's already been enough knowledge transfer. That means that the practice can go on as it was before. Secondly, we would argue that the practice is better off without him as a physician because in that over-reliance on house is a bad thing to the extent he is not that he is not a dependable individual. The first, opioid addiction means that he is likely to be more aggressive as a rule. That looks like first, being abrasive to his coworkers. There's a high turnover rate in terms of the people that he can work with. Very few people can tolerate him, specifically because his opioid addiction just makes him an unpleasant person to work around, a person who constantly yells at his colleagues and things like that. That means that they demand to be transferred to other departments, and this one can only be, you know, staffed by a couple or a handful of people who can tolerate his presence. That's obviously bad for the patients who actually attend that practice. Secondly, he's likely to be abrasive to patients. The extent where they tell you that patients have a good relationship with Dr. House, they don't give you any you know, ex explanation for why that would be the case other than desperation because he's willing to apply his unconventional tactics. He's likely to be more coarse to tell people that life does not matter, be more aggressive and aggressive about like the state and their conditions, especially if they have terminal illnesses and things like that. That means that he's not a particularly comforting figure He's not someone that actually helps patients throughout hard times. He's someone who's only there to fulfill, his, you know, his own, you know, ego and things like that and test out his own methods and things like that. That means that he does not have a good relationship with either his coworkers or his patients. That is bad for the practice as a whole. Secondly, we think that his opioid addiction means that the, the long-term usefulness that he has to this practice is severely diminished because opioid addiction obviously lessens your mental sharpness over time. It subjects you to things such as insomnia. It means that you're more fatigued at work because you can't sleep properly. It means you're more likely to suffer things that, side, side effects such as hallucinations and things like that. So even if he is a leading physician, we know that the fact that he's addicted to a sub, like, you know, opioid, op opioids and things like that, means that over time he is a li liability and actively is more likely to produce more harmful diagnoses or make more harmful prescriptions and things like that compared to otherwise, because he simply cannot be, be able to sustain this. We also mean that he just has memory lapses over time. That means that he cannot remember the training that he had or why a particular treatment worked in the past, meaning that he's more likely to prescribe or apply a treatment in an instance where it wouldn't have worked because he doesn't 
remember the specific context in which it actually did. So that necessarily means that his usefulness, this practice is severely diminished by virtue of his addiction. Secondly, we think that the ego means that he's unlikely to acknowledge his shortcomings because like to the extent where he thinks he's the leading physician, when people tell him that what you're doing is wrong, he's unlikely to actually buy that. Even if it is the case, that means that you amplify the harms this has to you know the patients and uh, makes it incredibly bad. What O, o says to this is that if he can't operate in a legal hospital, he will just do this in the back end. That means you should allow him to operate in a legal hospital. That doesn't make any sense. That isn't a reason for allowing someone to be a doctor. Like if I couldn't be a doctor, I would go and like, you know, operate on people in my house. That doesn't mean you should let me actually operate on people. You know, that doesn't make any sense. So you should just discount any of all of that material from, oh, oh. before I move on, I'll take a PI from CEO. You claim that House is irritable and bad at his job. Why hasn't he been fired yet? Noting that being fired is different from having your medical license suspended. I think the reason he hasn't been fired yet is because there are some rare instances where his, you know, prescriptions actually work because he's willing to do those in, in, in those instances. But in, but we, we tell you that in those instances, his medical team would also make those prescriptions and it is not worth the best amount of circumstances where he makes bad prescriptions. Secondly, we just think that his boss, like Cuddy, likes him a lot. That necessarily means that it is less likely, it is harder to actually be punitive against him um, and, and, and fire him. And, and so for all of those reasons, the practice would be better off without him as a physician because you can replicate it with other physicians. And because over time, even though right now he is not a liability he will become one his memory will get worse he'll become more erratic he will suffer more side effects like hallucinations that mean that his prescriptions will be bad and it's better to suspend him right now than wait for a patient to actually be harmed in order for you to actually do that it is better to actually preemptively stop that harm to that patient compared especially since they cannot prove a definitive benefit that house provides to patients in the status quo lastly how does this impact the field of medicine more broadly and i think that First, we think that when they do not suspend him, there's a loss of trust in the medical field in this, his community, because we would weigh past patients as less important than future people who might be skeptical of his medical practice. And we think that um, that, that, that that Seb gave you a list of reasons why people actually are bothered by him. The fact that he doesn't care about the religious practices of that community, the fact that you know there's a greater likelihood of medical malpractice occurring and harms of individuals happening because of the fact that he has an opioid addiction and things like that. That means that people are less likely to go to hospital and things like that within his community, specifically because they perceive him as an erratic actor and someone who will be in charge of their medical treatment if they go and seek it. That means that you actually turn people away from medicine. Secondly, his behavior is just replicated in other doctors. OO says that addiction is common in the medical industry. And if this is true, like if you buy this, that is the precise reason why you need to crack down on, 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 on cows. Because if this is the case, then the, the leading physician being suspended for having an opioid addiction actually does set a good precedent. It tells other doctors that you cannot fuck around with the lives of your patient and decide that you're too stressed so you're going to have an opioid addiction and treat your patients while high, prescribe them treatments while you're fatigued, while you might be hallucinating and things like that, and have disastrous consequences of their lives. This obviously reduces the harms that other people doctors could commit to future patients precisely because it shows them that their addictions are not to be tolerated and they should work on them. As a consequence, I've never been prouder to propose. Vote OG. DLO for that speech and I welcome Gov member to begin the closing half. You here. Closing government is going to take a substantially higher burden than opening government in this debate. Firstly, we're going to concede that House will not be able to practice medicine on our side of the House and defend why even in that circumstance we should still win the debate and why in fact more lives would be saved by kicking House out of the medical practice. Firstly, to deal with opening opposition's counterfactual claim that he'll illegally practice medicine. Firstly, this would be very easy to catch, so it's unlikely to occur for long. But two, House is smart, so we wouldn't do something that would get him caught. Three, he wants to solve puzzles, which illegally practicing medicine wouldn't allow him to do because he would lack the equipment and infrastructure necessary to get the best cases, to access things like MRIs and other imaging necessary to investigate those cases. And fourthly, his revealed preference is not to work illegally. For example, in season six, after he has a psychotic break, and his medical license is suspended, he's prevented from practicing medicine unless his psychologist agrees to give him uh, a letter of support. And he concedes to, for example, going back into Mayfield, even though he really doesn't want to, because he really wants his license back, which indicates he would be unwilling to work illegally. So we will defend him not being able to do any medical work. Three arguments then. Firstly, why we save more lives by suspending his license. The first thing I wanna do is just point out how small the benefit house actually produces in the series is. Firstly, he takes a shockingly limited number of cases. He sees one patient at a time, 
He often sees that one patient for like two or three weeks. There are large gaps between the cases he sees, and he's frequently just not seeing any patients because he's in prison, because he's in Mayfield, because he's like recovering from being shot or whatever. Like huge portions of the series, there's just no patients at all. Secondly, the outcomes for patients aren't particularly good. And this, to be fair, is not House's fault. He's a great doctor, but he's a doctor of last resort, which means he primarily sees patients who are already dying or whose lives are already ruined, which means that if you think about the quality adjusted life years, like the utility he's able to provide in terms of his diagnostic ability, it's very low because often his patients die anyway because they were already terminal or they have limited life or there are a variety of other sort of conditions that exist that even if he successfully diagnoses them, they have very limited life or very limited quality of life even after the diagnosis. And notably, House doesn't even care about that because he really only cares about the diagnosis. But most importantly, there is a massive opportunity cost to the existence of House. That is to say, firstly, he consumes such a disproportionate share of resources. He has five of the top doctors in the country on his payroll, and his department consumes like millions of dollars the equipment cost, the beds, priority access to imaging, labs, etc., and the tons of money that he drains through various legal costs, which could have far better uses. Like, think about what the effective altruists would do with the millions of dollars House does. They'd buy malaria nets and save millions of people. And notably, someone in the universe does this. Dr. Sebastian Charles, the TV doctor from TV or not TV, notably pisses House off because he saves so many more lives in House. We would much rather the money went somewhere like there, which seems like a very likely counterfactual use, like Cuddy redeploys it within the department and more money is spent on the ER, which actually saved lives, or more money is spent on preventative healthcare, or fees go down, all of which actually just does far more for improving people's health. But House also has other harmful effects. Like one, he destroys the MRI machine three different times, which puts it out of use for the entire hospital, and almost certainly means other people die because they can't get scans that they need. Secondly, like him pissing off Vogler means that the hospital loses a hundred million dollars of funding that obviously would have saved tons of lives. And when Vogler goes to fire him, like they look through the financials, House's department is a black hole. It costs millions of dollars. No one's paying in. It's actually draining resources the hospital needs to help other people. And notably, like that money would go to help hundreds of people as opposed to like one patient that House sees in a particular month. So obviously the trade-off here is very favorable. Notably, we think that it would be far better than if, for example, the team just didn't exist, noting it's really the only diagnostic department in the country. Like, there's a suggestion maybe Mercy has one, but it's probably axed after Foreman quits. But it's he's basically the only one who does it because he's so unique as a doctor. We think it'd be far better if diagnostic medicine just didn't exist and that money was spent on actually saving people's lives that can be done in a very cost-effective and efficient way. But even if the diagnostic department did have to exist, obviously Dr. Robert Chase would be more than capable of just taking House's place. Notably, he does so at the end of the series quite effectively. And if you actually watch the show, he has basically as many solves as House. He's the second most successful doctor, and he gets progressively better as the series goes on. He's even limping by the end. So we think he'd be very well capable of filling that role if needed. What is the impact of this argument? It explains that on net, we actually save more lives, which is the metric opening opposition relies on in this debate, so it immediately takes us over them. But it also beats out opening government, because we don't rely on the crutch of him being a consultant and practicing medicine anyway, and we win the trade-off, whereas they require sort of believing that they're able to get marginally more lives saved. We just prove we outright win on that metric. Second argument is on precedent, which is just to say that it's really bad that House is allowed to get away with all the sorts of crimes that he, in fact, is able to get away with over the course of the show. Things like Viking addiction, things like breaking into patients' houses, drug abuse, driving car into Cuddy's house, lying to other doctors, lying to the transplant committee, etc., etc. Because it says to everyone, if you're a good enough doctor, you can get away with anything, you're above the law. Which is bad, one, because on net we say House does more harm than good, but it tells other doctors they can do this as well. It gives them permission. And notably, we don't know if those doctors will do more harm, more good than harm, and often people overestimate how important they are. So it encourages lots of doctors to break the rules in lots of circumstances in a way that is deeply harmful and regrettable. Finally, though, we say House will be happier in a world where he's suspended from practicing medicine. Why is that true? Before that, I'll take a POI from CO. Uh, what other doctor could possibly be brave enough to prescribe mouse bites to a dying patient? Chase, obviously. He proves by the end that he is more than capable as a replacement for House. Why would House be happier? Firstly, why is House unhappy? It's not actually any of the things you think, like the Vicodin or the leg, etc. We know the key reason he's unhappy is because he thinks being unhappy is necessary for him to be a good doctor. It's why when he gets on the methadone and actually fixes all his problems, he, he quits that because it makes him miss a symptom and miss a diagnosis. And he believes that it's necessary that he's in constant pain in order to be at his peak as a diagnostician. 
When we foreclose the possibility of practicing medicine, which I explain in the counterfactual he will not believe he'll be able to do, that finally grants him permission to be happy. And there are so many tools he could immediately use to alleviate his pain. He could go back on the methadone, he could give up the Vicodin, he could engage in physical therapy, or all of the other things that show promise throughout the series, but ultimately don't work because House doesn't want to be happy because he thinks being happy will result in patients dying. Now he finally has that opportunity. He can have meaningful relationships, which are all compromised by his misery. He can have hobbies, he can go back to cooking. He can finally be a proper friend to Wilson, an entirely selfless character who we think we have a huge principled obligation to help. And he stops causing suffering to everyone around him who suffers hugely because he's just in pain all the time. And he causes like Wilson to lose his job, be arrested, his girlfriend to die. Like avoiding those harms we think is a huge benefit. But this is also just the most certain and proximate benefit in the debate, which is why closing government takes it. I thank government member for that speech. Welcome opposition member to begin the team's case. Hear him. Three extensions in his speech. Firstly, on why he's done no wrong and he should be given his Vicodin. Secondly, on why this just nukes the hospital. And then finally, on why he goes a bit freak mode and does a bunch of fucked up shit. Firstly, on why he's done no wrong and he should get his Vicodin. The first thing to say here is he's just unconventional within the info slide. The average person maybe hasn't watched House in the ways that it seems other people have. I personally have, though. Don't worry. Notably, then, this suggests that he's like just giving cases other people can't solve, which necessitates unconventional things. That is to say, other people have tried the conventional method. You try the unconventional method after that. The second thing is to say that he's amongst a team that somewhat limits his behavior and his ability to do things. Third one is just to say, yes, on opioids, he does just have a chronic pain condition. They messed up a surgery on his leg and he requires Vicodin to live a comfortable life, I think that's fair. I think he should be allowed to not have chronic pain. The next thing, though, is just to say that the impact of this overall is he's not evil and bad like opening government tries to describe and tell you. Instead, he's maybe just a doctor that does unconventional things and has Vicodin for a chronic pain condition that he does in fact have. Now then let's talk about why he nukes the hospital. Noting here that so far, outside of Udai, everyone has talked about like the individual house patients that he sees. This is obviously a much broader impact because it's everyone within the hospital. Firstly, then, on why he isn't able to consult, because that's the way opening government tries to mitigate against this. Firstly, this is a crime. He has been, he's not being fired, he's being disbarred from medical practice. And part of practicing medicine is consulting on medical things. That is to say, that's also a crime. Secondly, this looks like protecting your friends. That is to say, the people they describe as it would be allowing House to do this consulting is the sort of thing that wouldn't be, would be looked down upon by the criminal justice system. That is to say, they rely on House's friends defending House so that he can still practice. That's something that looks extraordinarily suspicious and something they wouldn't allow. Third though, the people who you think would be pushing it, pushing for him to be able to continue consulting are ones who are complicit in his crimes. That is to say, when you are in a hospital, and what everyone seems to ignore, there's a set of mandatory reporting mechanisms for when you do commit crimes, when a doctor commit crimes, you have to report medical malpractice when you see it and witness it. His entire team has witnessed what is the medical malpractice you think is happening. There is an investigation into his medical malpractice. They see the things that people have been doing. They see what Cuddy is doing. This nukes a huge amount of the administrative branch of this hospital. Furthermore, it nukes the amazing doctors that Udai talks about. That is to say, you lose a huge amount of skill and talent within this hospital, which is extraordinarily bad. Furthermore, he isn't, as I said before, being fired. He's being suspended from practice, which is a different thing. That is to say, if he was fired, he might be able to get a consulting role. Notably here, this takes out opening government because they rely on him being a consultant. Because the premise of the show is that his advice is key to solving cases. Every time the team wants to do something, he wants to do something else, he does his thing and the patient survives. That is to say, they're like, oh, we save people. We have a team that's okay. The premise of the show is the team isn't good enough and a house needs to be there that is to say when they don't have it as a consultant they fail at the part of getting these people solve people's cases solved further than on how this hurts the hospital as i've already said you nuke the leadership of this hospital because house is already fairly high up and everyone above him knows what he does the people below him within his team that is very specialized also see what he does all those people have failed to do their mandatory reporting they will be nuked they will be disbarred that is a harm to this hospital in the immediate short term but secondly this is a private hospital investment into this hospital relies on people having faith in that hospital and seeing it as being well functioning when the best doctor in the world has just been disbarred every doctor around him has just been disbarred everyone above him in that administration has just been disbarred that nukes the amount of investment into this hospital if you thought this hospital was useful for people is notably a teaching a teaching hospital is the plainsboro princeton plainsboro teaching hospital that nukes the ability for the hospital to meaningfully engage in teaching into the long term which is a much broader impact in this debate 
Furthermore, as I just alluded to, he's a teacher. It's a teaching hospital. He is just a good, per got good doctor that should be able to teach people and teach people his ways. That then explains why it's bad for him to be removed. Now then, let's impact this and extend it and like do some, do a bit more wham. This is to say that House doesn't just like deals with patients as the opening government describes. But this explains why the entire hospital gets a bit nuked. There's way less money in this hospital. If you care about Uday's definitions of money, the hospital has barely any now. That is to say that even if House is a hole of money, when he goes and everyone else around him gets disbarred, the hospital no longer gets as much money coming into it in the first place. That is upstream. That then explains why the hospital gets nuked. Everyone that goes to the hospital gets hurt by this. Not, the, not just like the one patient a month that House sees. That is a much broader impact than anyone else has brought in this debate and outweighs everything else. Now then, let's talk about closing government quickly on this. Firstly, about consuming too many resources. The problem is they still do this anyway, but they often have to use more because he is a now they are worse at diagnosing. They have to run more tests. They have to do more imaging. That results in far more cost. But furthermore, when he's like the only, the only diagnostic team, brother, what? Like differential diagnostic isn't some one in the world thing. He's the best at the world, not because he's the only one, because he is the best at it. That explains why it's unclear why they wouldn't just try and do this anyway. Now then let's talk about him going a bit freak mode. This is to say that when he gets put out, he is still a drug addict to some extent. He still uses Vicodin. I just do think he overdoses. I do think he consumes far more drugs because he is taken away the main source and purpose of what he sees in his life. When that does get taken away from him, when he feels as if he can't access it again, that is something that is extraordinary harm. And this is in the short term. So you can't believe open government. They're like, oh, he'll seek out help. No, he just overdoses and dies. That's bad for him. Secondly, though, he just antagonizes the hospital to a particularly large amount. That is to say, he is very like vengeful in the show and engages in a bit of, I guess, mischief. And that is to say then that he's going to do a bunch of things. He's going to do things like misinformation. Noting here, he is just the best diagnosis agnostic person in the world. So even when he gets disbarred, particularly if you think he gets disbarred for just simply using Vicodin, he's still seen as a trusted person. And so when he engages in this misinformation, it is particularly pernicious and successful. But furthermore, he just like assists people in doing bad things to the hospital, like getting people to go in and telling them how they can go about getting drugs and messing up the diagnostic practices that would continue to happen in that hospital. Take a POI from opening if you have one. We explain reasons that are uncontingent on him consulting to prevent House's practice, like the quality of his team. Can you explain that and also the millions of dollars that we unlock by not having it sit in a bank account as an allowance for potential lawsuits? So that's something Uday says, but cool. But the next thing is just to say that like, you're like, okay, so the problem is your understanding of the show is that this really awesome team that could solve all these cases by themselves and House just tags along and does things. Like the premise of the show is that House is a better doctor, is, as the info suggests, the world's best. And you know who isn't the world's best? Not House. That's the team. The team isn't House. So that explains why you have a worse diagnostic team because you lose the best person in the world. But furthermore, this is a set of people who are learning from House. So it's unclear that they're the second, third, and fourth best people in, diagno in like being able to diagnose people. So the quality of this team has gone down significantly from what it would otherwise be. Furthermore, though, it is just unclear to me why, like, like, I just don't get it. Like, the premise of the show is like someone comes in and they're like, oh, I have this illness. Everyone goes like, oh, let's do the conventional thing. Conventional thing doesn't work. House is like, let's do this other thing. Everyone's like, no, don't do that other thing. And then he does the other thing anyway. The patient survives. Necessarily, House is an integral step to solving that patient's problem. That's the framework of every episode in the show. I'm sorry. And necessarily, like, if you don't have House, patient dies. Question mark, question mark, question mark. Where's your benefit? Like, what? Okay. That then explains why we win this debate. Firstly, because we explain why this nukes the hospital's ability to function. You lose the best doctor in the world. You lose the administrative branch of that hospital. You lose huge amounts of investment. That's what everyone that wants to go to that hospital. Every doctor that would have taught at that hospital and gone to other hospitals around the world is just a lost cause on this opposite, on this government side. Furthermore, he just antagonizes the hospital in ways that are particularly pernicious. For those reasons, proud to oppose. and thank uh, opposition members for that speech and welcome government whip to conclude government here let's start with closing opposition they make three claims firstly they say house has done nothing wrong so it would be wrong to punish him because he's just unconventional two strands of response the first thing we'd say is that our third extension demonstrates that this would actually be in house's best interest so it would not meaningfully constitute a form of punishment but actually a form of reward so even if you believe that house is entirely a good person that is still a reason to implement the van secondly though he has done things that are not just unconventional but clearly criminal i point to numerous examples he breaks into nearly every patient's house he drives a car into cuddy's house he abuses drugs like he's committed numerous crimes he gets freedom master like nearly killed and puts him into a catatonic state like there are so many examples of egregious crimes that he commits over the series he probably does deserve to be in jail and not just 
for example, have his license suspended, beyond other forms of like clear medical malpractice, lying to the transplant committee, lying to other doctors, misleading other people, etc., all of which is clearly more than just being unconventional. The second claim we get from them is that this would be bad for the hospital. We get three reasons. Firstly, they say the rest of the team will leave, which will be bad. Firstly, it's unclear that that is harm. If they just go to practice medicine in a different combination, like Chase goes back to being a surgeon or something, we'd say on net that probably saves more lives and would be entirely fine with that. Secondly, they say everyone else in the hospital will also lose their license. I think that's unlikely for a number of reasons. Firstly, House gets his license sort of suspended in a number of instances or semi-suspended in a number of instances. No one else is really punished around him, which suggests that it would be very unlikely that the circumstances under which this suspension would occur would entail that. Secondly, everyone else is pretty good at covering their ass. Like, often House gets away with stuff, but it's in a way where everyone is saying, no, you can't do that, such that they would have very good defenses for when the lawyers came around. Like, you know, Cuddy is pretty smart, has set up the necessary checks and balances in order to be able to disclaim responsibility. They do make everyone sign waivers before House does his crazy stuff, etc. And also, if you believe, like, also, this argument is entirely in tension with the first argument given to you by closing opposition, because if you believe House has done nothing wrong, then the suspension clearly could not also implicate everyone else in the lack of anything wrong he's done. Clearly, House just gets suspended because everyone hates him, and it'd be very easy to justify, but there'd be no reason to extend that to the people around him. Finally, they say you lose him as a teacher. He's, like, literally never taught anyone. He's a misanthrope. He refuses to engage with anyone. Obviously, no one is learning from him in the context of this hospital. Finally, they say the team will become worse as a result of House leaving. Firstly, our first extension explains why this is a benefit, because they will just go back to not doing diagnostics, which is in fact far better. And notably, diagnostics isn't a real field in medicine. Like, the ordinary intelligent voter should know that there aren't doctors who do diagnostics, it's not a specialization, it's not a thing that happens. And I think even within the universe of the show, it's pretty clear it's not a thing that happens. There's no real other diagnostics departments, which is why when House quits his job, he has to convince hospitals to start one up. Like, when he gets on methadone and Cuddy fires him, he's like, maybe I can convince New York Mercy to have a diagnostics department, because no one else has one. It's not a thing that exists. But secondly, the fact that it loses millions of dollars explains why it wouldn't be a thing that exists. Like, what hospital in a for-profit healthcare system is like, let's do a thing that will cost us millions of dollars a year for no real benefit, which is why it doesn't exist. But even if it were comparatively the case that the hospital would continue to keep its diagnostics department, we explain that Chase would be more than adequate to fill that role. Because as that series goes on, House becomes increase, increasingly erratic and bad at solving cases, whereas Chase becomes increasingly good at doing so, his success rate goes up. And notably, like, even though House is a quite good doctor, he doesn't even solve the majority of cases on his own. It's the team as a whole that solves them, and often the epiphany is had by one of the other doctors. Like, Chase has the second highest number of epiphanies, and the total set of successes by the team exceeds the total number of successes by House quite substantially. So the harm here is very limited. And I just think the value in doing this at all is pretty low, as our first extension points to. Hospitals need to engage in triage, there's limited healthcare resources, and spending millions of dollars saving one patient a month is actually just ludicrous when it could be saving thousands or millions of people if we donated that money to, say, Dr. Sebastian Charles, who would be able to do a far better job here. So I think this takes closing opposition out of the debate, and obviously our remaining unresponded to extensions quite neatly way over them. Let's then engage with opening opposition, because their main metric for why it is that they should win the debate is literally just to point to, one, the idea that House will counterfactually and illegally prescribe medicine, which we defeat quite soundly in our uh, in setup in terms of what the counterfactual is likely to be, and secondly, that House saves such a high number of lives that we should bear any cost in order to sort of gain that benefit. But our first extension handily explains why, on net, the loss of, of House's medical license would in fact save lives, why the counterfactual allocation of those funds would be far better, and why the benefit House produces is so minimal within the series. So this takes us over opening opposition. Let's then deal with opening government. They have sort of two pathways to winning. The first one is they point out that House causes some minor harms, things like he puts patients at risk sometimes, he causes other harms, he mocks religious people, etc. All of which is definitely true uh, and, you know, well proven, but I think it's just not very impactful in the debate. And we prove the much larger harm when we talk about how House sets a negative precedent that means that many other doctors feel emboldened in order to, for example, break the law. Many other people feel that they're above the law. It makes it much harder to enforce the rules against doctors all across the country, which is a far larger scale of harm. 
But secondly, we also outweigh them because rather than relying on sort of symmetricizing the issue of house saving lives and then pointing to minor harms, we actually flip the issue of house saving lives and demonstrate that on net house is harmful. And therefore, even if we were to lose him, we still save more lives, which is the more valuable impact at the end of this. So that takes us over the top half. The final thing I want to do is then just whip the remaining extension we give you, which is just to explain that this makes House happy. And there are a number of reasons why this is a very important extension within the debate. Firstly, here's the titular character of the show, which means you should obviously, within the universe of the show, care about him substantially more than everyone else. Secondly, we point out that him being happy has flow-on benefits to the universe of the show, because it means he stops causing disutility to the people around him. And in fact, he'll finally, for example, be a good partner. He's less likely to drive the, the car into Cuddy's house and ruin her life. He's less likely to ruin Wilson's life in the various ways that he do. And you should probably care about those characters and their chance of happiness as well. But also, this is also just the most proximate and certain impact in the debate. Because who knows like whether a life will be saved or won't be saved and counterfactually how good their life would be. But we know for certain that one person will just avoid a huge amount of suffering and a huge amount of pain. And that really matters. Let me explain uniquely why that is only possible on our side. That House chooses to suffer because he feels it's necessary. And only by re removing the necessity by taking away his license, we finally give him permission to be happy, to, to permit himself to, for example, self-prioritize to get back on the methadone, to try physical therapy, to get back into cooking, to do the things that would make a meaningful difference. For all those reasons, because it's better for society, because it's better for the practice of medicine, because it's better for house. Proud to go. All right, I thank Government Whip for that speech and welcome Opposition Whip to conclude the debate. Can you hear? Hello. Uh, can people hear me? Oh, nice. Mm. At the end of this debate, the only things you know about House's behavior is that he is unconventional and he is erratic. All the claims about him driving cars into people's houses just seem really unlikely to me, and I'm deeply uncertain whether you can credit those in the debate. Firstly, I'm going to explain why House genuinely has done no wrong, and all of the inconspicuous things he's done are results of the situations he's put himself in as a medical diagnostic. This noticeably takes the wind out of the sails out of any argument from the, uh, from the government bench. Firstly, we explained that he shouldn't be disbarred because of, his, because of his addiction to Vicodin, because he is just in constant pain. This is corroborated by closing government when they talk about his need for physical therapy, which means that even though he is taking Vicodin, it's not medical abuse and he shouldn't be disbarred for it, he's just medicating an illness that he has, which means it's not grounds for disbarment in any way. But second of all, we explained to you he practices well and in good faith, because first of all, he's a doctor and has a revealed preference for care, and because he is a diagnostic doctor that takes referrals from other doctors that cannot diagnose the conditions, which means that while he might be erratic and unconventional, that is a necessary part of the circumstance he finds himself in. It would literally, literally be in possible to diagnose things by conventional methods, because if you could conventionally define the diseases we're talking about, they wouldn't be given to him the original doctors would know the diseases we're talking about and just be able to heal them. This then explains that he is not doing anything wrong medically and any issues he is taking are just reactions to the situation he is in. This means it would simply be immoral to disbar this man. How does this deal with the other claims in the debate? Firstly, from opening opposition, they try to weigh out the claim about all of the bad stuff House might do by saying, well, he just does so much good. But I'll note that this is a weird way and a weird perspective to approach to rules because even if those someone's doing a lot of good, it's bad if they break the rules out of mouse. We explain to you why he is in fact an not breaking rules out of mouse and doing the things that he's been forced through as a result of this situation, which means we take on a higher burden than our opening. Opening government claim he's one evil dude and thus should be disbarred. But first of all, we explained that the actual instances of malice that they talk about are just figments of their imagination. Like, they never proved the blood stuff and the car stuff and the assault stuff and the prison stuff. Are you seriously going to award the debate on those assertions which the average person definitely does not know about house? But second of all, explains that the infringements are fine because the alternative to his inconspicuous behavior is literally no diagnostics for those patients at all, which means they never healed as a result of their disease. All that is left from opening government at this point is that sometimes he is mean to his co-workers. That isn't grounds to have your medical license taken away. That is grounds to be fired, which explains to you why even if you believe he's nasty and mean and drives people away, that is not a high enough burden to remove 
Rufus medical license. Closing government says that it's bad that House does this and we should just buy him because he sets bad precedent. But we first of all mean, uh, this extension means first of all, the precedent he sets isn't bad and is actually fine to follow. But second of all, it means that there's a series of other mitigating factors, which means it's fine the things that he does. Closing government says that he breaks into houses and does crimes. But as I said before, he literally doesn't do that. That's a strange thing to say someone does, which means, and also if he does, it's only like the most important cases where like life and death hangs in the balance. Very important stuff. I'll take opening. Uh, yeah, legal fees, community trust, and doctor president come out of the OG bench and get derived by CG. These benefits have huge reach that no one has responded to. Also, was it okay to save a Jehovah's Witness in season four, season four and send them to hell by transfusing blood in doing so? You keep just, like, quoting these episodes like they're scripture or something. Like, I have no idea what you're talking about. You claim that there's, like, a legal fund in this hospital? To, like, uh, like the, the hospitals have legal funds for one guy? Like, no, they don't. This is a weird claim to make. Second extension, though, is explaining why the hospital collapses in the absence of house. Because, first of all, he's very good at providing a teaching role because he's surrounded by other physicians who learn things. Second of all, he attracts physicians to the hospital because he's the best in the land. And because, uh, sec uh, third of all, he attracts funding because he's very good at his job and does interesting work. And fourth of all, there'd be a wave of disbarment if he, in fact, was investigated because everyone who was complicit in the things he was talking about would also get kicked out. How does CRG try to rebut this? First, they say he doesn't actually teach, but first of all, it's a teaching hospital he teaches. But second of all, if you're on the team, you implicitly just learn things from being around him. So even if he hates teaching, people just observe him and do the things he's talking about. Second of all, they say that it's fine if these other physicians leave because House's star power is gone. And maybe in the long term, it's fine because they practice elsewhere. But in the short term, a bunch of physicians have now suddenly left this hospital so now a bunch of people don't have anyone to treat them and that's very very bad they second of all say in rebuttal well it's unlikely that everyone else would be disbarred because it's happened once in the show and everyone's good at covering their asses but the issue with this is that when someone is disbarred as a result of doing a medical malpractice everyone in the hospital is investigated and because there are mandatory reporting requirements even though they've signed stuff the fact that they haven't reported it is enough to make them enough to let them lose their license so even if they themselves don't engage in the malpractice they would still lose their license but second of all, you do engage them in our practice. They second of all say that, well, this material seems like it's in tension with your first argument, but it's not, because our first argument explains why there's no malice in the action he takes, but we still assume that he does some inconspicuous and wacky things that the medical establishment wouldn't like. We say that everyone else is complicit in those things because they're aware of his actions and also, also lose all of the stuff they have. The impact to this claim is that many physicians are suddenly dumber, lose their jobs, or leave, which is bad for the hospital because fewer people are treated. This deals with the opening opposition because they say it'd be bad to lose house because he can't treat those people anymore. But the issue with this claim is that we expand it to literally everyone else in the hospital with all of his friends, family, and administrators who now lose their jobs as a result and those people wouldn't get treated. It needs to open government because they say, well, we'd hire him as a consultant, but this claim is already dead in the water. Obviously, it's illegal to hire him, so that wouldn't work. And they second of all say that it's good to fire house because it stops so much of harm being done. We explain why house allows a bunch of resources in the hospital to exist and a bunch of physicians to exist. So even if he does harm, it enables other people to do good. And it beats CG because their big claim is that House just costs so much because first of all, he breaks MRI machines. It seems like an unlikely thing for a licensed physician to do. But second of all, because you've got to put a lot of money into this department. But the reason this claim doesn't work is because first of all, we explained that a lot of people donate to the university as a result of this department because it's doing new and interesting work. Governments give the money and private organizations fund it. And this means that it is in fact fine to have House there because even if he costs money, people put money into it. They second of all say that diagnosis is too expensive, so we'd rather this department goes away and sure it's expensive for every individual patient house patient house treat treats but it sets medical precedent for the future so even if it costs ten thousand dollars to save one person's life you now know how to save a life in the instance of that disease which means it's fine that this cost is incurred by the hospital the result of this is we save a bunch of lives very clearly by having house around because the amount of first of all resources he brings in and second of all the amount of people he stops being despised well, finally, on this being bad for House, and this engages with the extension from closing our government. We say when he has no outlet to do stuff, he likely dies of an overdose or is actively antagonistic. Closing government says, well, he's sad on purpose, and so firing him would make him happy. But this is insane. Why would you dedicate your life to something that makes you sad? Why would you not do the things that make you happy? Obviously, if it was good for him to not be doing medicine anymore, he would have stopped doing medicine, right? He's a rational actor. He's a smart guy, which explains why it would, in fact, make him sad if you fired him. And even in the, if the long curve of justice, he would somehow better himself, he would likely die before that because he takes too much Viking because he's really sad that he can't solve his puzzles anymore. All right, I thank uh, Officer Schmidt for that speech and everyone for this debate.